Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, April 14th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight. Could this report explain the holes in U.S. cybersecurity? Then, you'll be shocked how some students are being treated on college campuses. After that, what news topic are Americans sick of hearing about? And with all the negative talk about walls, is it okay for the police to place one around Trump demonstrators? That's next. And as you can see, there's already protester barriers set up by the NYPD. They were setting these up last night and they stretch, I don't know, basically about six blocks in either direction because they are expecting a large number of protesters here tonight. Uh, or there's a Facebook page out, uh, one Jews against Trump. One uh, 1,400 protesters expect, definitely saying they're going to come. Another 3,000 said they're interested in coming. But last night, there was a rally in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I'm going to bring Joe Big. Well, according to some in the tech community, a ludicrous, dangerous, and technically illiterate proposal is making its way through the Senate Intelligence Committee. Now, this bit of legislation is called the Compliance with Court Orders Act, and it would require technology companies to design and manufacture smartphones, computers, and software that's accessible to government. Apple, Microsoft, Google, and other corporations would be required to provide backdoor keys and encryption workarounds if this bill becomes the law. Now, according to the act, it requires the provision of data in an intelligible format to a government pursuant to a court order and for other purposes. And of course, the bill does not define what those other purposes are. Now, committee chairman Richard Burr says, consumers have a right to seek solutions that protect their information. I do not believe, however, that those solutions should be above the law. And the vice chairman, Diane Feinstein says, no entity or individual is above the law. Well, now you'll recall that James Comey came out a few weeks ago and said that American people needed to demand to know how the government is using their information. Obviously, you know, they're kind of backtracking here on that. But here's someone that is above the law, apparently the Department of Justice. Now, Microsoft is actually suing them over gag laws that they say are blocking customers from knowing that the government is getting their data. Now, they filed this lawsuit today. Uh, this is against the U.S. Justice Department they claim the government's authority to block the technology companies from notifying customers when their personal data has been accessed is unconstitutional. And the lawsuit alleges that the federal government is increasingly using search warrants to comb through customer information that's held by Microsoft and that is essentially banning the company from ever letting people know about the government's behavior. And of course, this is very important if people are in a court case and they need to build up their defense. Uh, they don't know how the Department of Justice is accessing this information. Microsoft said it understands there are times when secrecy is needed, but that the rising number of orders has caused it to question whether the government's policy is too lax. And so you give them an inch, they take a mile. Now, others have suggested that companies like Microsoft have become less willing to co cooperate with the government, even when these search warrants have been approved. And in other battles like we've seen between the FBI and Apple over their encrypted iPhones, companies are leaning more toward privacy in order to protect their customer base. And the government just cannot have that. Now, if you go back to this Compliance with Court Orders Act, uh, a chief technologist at the Center for Democracy and Technology says this is effectively the most anti-crypto bill of all anti-crypto bills. It basically outlaws end-to-end -end encryption. And Wired argues that the bill ignores the conclusion of top cryptographers that weakening encryption would be used by hackers and foreign governments to steal personal data. And during its battle with the FBI in court over encryption, Apple said that removing security measures on devices would amount to unilateral disarmament in an endless war with hackers. Oh, but the government is not concerned with that. They just need to be able to get in and spy on you and me, even though it has not helped them stop a single terror attack. But check this out. According to the latest report, the U.S. government is worse than all major industries on cybersecurity. So we should listen to them when they say that companies should be forced to put a back door in all of our products so that they can easily access them and spy them. Who cares if it's going to be this unilateral disarmament and we will be in endless war with hackers? The government, 
<laughs> they are they came in last and this is transportation retail and healthcare the US federal state and local government agencies ranked last in cybersecurity and this is according to analysis from security scorecard they measured the relative security health of government industries across 10 categories, including vulnerability to malware infections, exposure rates of passwords, and susceptibility to social engineering, such as an employee using corporate account information on a public social network. And this was, they tracked uh, major government data from April 2015 to April 2016, and they scored absolutely last from all major industries. So why are we trusting these people and allowing them to pass anti-crypto bills when they don't even understand it? They spent millions of dollars trying to build a defective healthcare.gov, and of course, they've been hacked into numerous times. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Let's just go ahead and give them full access to all of our private information. But here's another government agency that's a little untrustworthy, but for whatever reason, they are in control of just about all of our lives, especially right around tax season. Well, now a federal judge is calling the IRS untrustworthy in the Tea Party case. Now, dozens of groups have, of course, said that the IRS not only treated them badly in the past, but that the agency continues to subject them to special monitoring and intrusive scrutiny, damaging their reputation among potential donors and making it more likely that the groups are going to face an audit because of their political beliefs. But the IRS insists it has retrained its employees and instructed managers to behave better. But the panel of judges on the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia did not seem convinced, and the judge said, it's hard to find the IRS to be an agency we can trust. And now the lawyer for the IRS at one point acknowledged that there were still potential problems with the way the agency monitors cases going forward, but insists that the initial targeting at the point groups applying for the nonprofit status, that initial targeting, that's ended. I mean, there might still be some potential problems moving forward, you know, but they've trained them, um, you know, everything's fine. Just look away and, you know, there's no need to revise the tax system. Everything's working. It's not a bloated government. Now, one company that is finally speaking out against this administration and its bullies within the administration is a shoe company here that actually makes a small percentage, mind you, of its shoes here in America. This is New Balance. Now they are speaking out against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Boston Globe is reporting that the US-based shoe manufacturer, New Balance, has come out hard against the TPP, and now we know why. They say New Balance officials were told by the Department of Defense that they'd give them serious consideration for a contract to outfit recruits with athletic shoes, but no order has been placed, and New Balance officials say the Pentagon is intentionally delaying any purchases. And so now New Balance is reviving its fight against the trade deal, uh, which would in part gradually phase out tariffs on shoes made in Vietnam. A loss of those tariffs would make imports cheaper and jeopardize its factory jobs in New England. And the VP of Public Affairs for the company says, we swallowed the poison pill that is TPP so we could have a chance to bid on these contracts. We were assured this would be a top-down approach at the Department of Def Defense if we agreed to either support or remain neutral on the TPP. But of course, now they see the chances of the Department of Defense buying shoes that are made in the USA are slim to none while Obama is president. And if this is just a shoe company speaking out, imagine all of the other corporations that are being silenced by the Obama administration in order to pass through the TPP. Other companies that can see how detrimental this is gonna be to American businesses, what remains of, America, of the American industry. Um, they're not speaking out, possibly they've also been promised a little cut of the deal. So this is very interesting and I hope that we see some other American corporations speaking out, uh, letting their conscience get the better of them. One person who, as we know, is not going to do that because he's all in on these globalist policies is Mark Zuckerberg. And of course, the other day, Zuckerberg spoke, spoke out against Trump's plans to build the wall, uh, saying that, you know, it would prevent a connected world and a global economy. But of course, Donald Trump has hit back saying that Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg's criticism of this border wall uh, is pretty hypocritical because Zuckerberg lives in a luxurious mansion with private security 
miles away from the U.S. border. And as we know, he's got a massive wall around his compound and tons of security. Of course, he doesn't want you to have guns, just his security guards. Oh, Zuckerberg. Now, the University of Wisconsin is just the latest university who is now singling out white students for some re-education. And this was um, a special workshop hosted on Tuesday for the purpose of getting white students to acknowledge and confront their own white privilege. And the, the workshop is called The Privilege of Whiteness. And it's designed for white people to reflect on and name the ways their privilege impacts their beliefs and behaviors by gaining the skills to identify the historical roots of white privilege and how it manifests today. Oh, I'm exhausted just reading that sentence. But that's not the only university. A business class at Purdue University is actually teaching students the phrase, America is a melting pot is a microaggression. Yep, that's right, We that's a microaggression. America can't be a melting pot. Additional microaggressions include, where are you from? There is only one race, the human race. Everyone can succeed in society if they work hard enough. And I believe the most qualified person should get the job. <laughs> Who knew Anita Sarkeesian was right? Everything's racist, everything's sexist, Everything's homophobic, and we've got to point it all out. Now, the Sanders supporters, the Sanders camp, they've actually tr triggered the Clinton camp. A very popular Twitter account uh, in support of Bernie Sanders tweeted out how people need to stop uh, voting in corporate Democratic whores. Well, oh my God, super sexist. You can't call Hillary Clinton a corporate whore. And she demanded that Bernie Sanders disavow his supporters' comments on Twitter. But you know what? Let's go to our trusty little uh, Urban Dictionary back here. This is, if you want to know what the kids are into these days, <laughs> go to Urban Dictionary. And you can see there the definition for corporate whore, written in about 2008, includes Hillary Diane Rodham Clinton. So I don't know. You're, that's, a, that's a fax right there, right? Straight out of the Urban Dictionary. And the corporate media whores have descended upon New York. More than 700 of them will be covering tonight's Democratic debate. Interesting to see if this topic will be brought up. But you know what? What's the point? We have all now come to the realization that the entire system is rigged. Now, Brian Tui joined the Alex Jones Show today to talk about the sports organizations that are rigging their own games for their own benefit, much like our political system. The other way I like to look at a potential fix is the league fixing their own games. And that's something a lot of people, and that's why I get labeled a conspiracy theorist for, but that's what a lot of people don't necessarily consider is the fact that the leagues can use the same apparatus that organized crime is used to fix games. They could use those same things to fix their own games, and they have actually more control over their own games. And the fact of the matter is they have more to gain from fixing their own games because that's how they make their money is through fan interest and television ratings, and if they fix games to make them exciting, and I'm not saying every game is fixed, but just certain tweaks here and there to manipulate their own league, well, then they're going to make more profit, and it's going to benefit everybody involved from the players, the coaches, the owners, everyone. Wow, that's fascinating. I'd never thought about that. I mean, we always, as you point out, we always think about organized crime, uh, leaning on people or basically, you know, threatening them or incentivizing them to throw a game so that they can make a lot of money off the gambling. I had never really thought about the leagues fixing it for them themselves to make it more entertaining. But of course, that's yet another parallel to politics. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. You know, you have people who are voting with what they believe. And, you know, people can say that's right, that's wrong. You should vote for this candidate, not that candidate. But when the fact of the matter is when you have your vote and you think it counts for a delegate, for example, towards Donald Trump and the Republican Party is coming out and saying, well, maybe it's not going to. We're going to spin it to somebody else, whoever we deem necessary. Well, then, you know, it makes you feel as a voter. Does your vote count? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the grand scheme thing that they're trying to do is trying to show you that maybe your vote doesn't count. Yeah. And maybe yeah. they do just really control everything. And that's, you know, as an American, that should be a really frightening situation, whether you want Trump in or you don't want Trump in the fact of the matter that this is occurring should make you really second guess everything. And I think that may be part of the game. 
maybe trying to get people so disillusioned with the system that they don't show up. Because I believe that if they have enough people show up, I, I believe that they can shave points just like they do in sport sporting events. They can shave points at the poll. They can shave points in terms of delegate selection and that sort of thing. Uh, they can, they can uh, you know, stuff the ballot box or they can uh, manipulate the voting machines to shave points. But I think if you come in with an overwhelming, overwhelming uh, number of people, they will pull back and try to rig the system at the next level instead of trying to do it in the election. So I think part of this exposure is to just discourage people from even showing up and voting. I, th I think that's a real key part of this. And with 700 reporters in attendance for tonight's Democratic debate, we know what's gonna be in the news for the foreseeable future. Well, Jakari Jackson wanted to find out what are people here in Austin, Texas, sick and tired of hearing about? We're out here in the streets of Austin to ask people, with all the news that's going on, what news story are they most tired of hearing about? Hey, how you doing today, ladies? We're fine. Good. We're just asking people, what news story are you most tired of hearing about? Donald Trump. 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 Donald Trump. Everybody? Yes. 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 Donald Trump. Uh -huh. about. We're asking people what news story they're most tired of hearing about. Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> I would say Kardashians, Zika, <laughs> and Donald Trump. And what else? I think that's it, those three. The unholy trinity. Yeah. The election. The election. It's, yeah, it's bad. I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm, I haven't been on Facebook in weeks, mostly because I've got a new baby, but I just stay away from Facebook. I stay away from all of it. Honestly, I'm not even really listening to Alex Jones anymore because I can't handle listening to any more political stuff. Is there anything that we should be talking about instead? Anything you think is more important? Um, I just think finding a great leader for our country is really important right now. And um, just all the swirling around negative things about candidates, I think, needs to stop. Is there anything that we should be talking about instead of Donald Trump? Hmm. I think, what are we going to do with the homeless people? <laughs> The panicked elite are buying up underground bunkers and or fleeing to parts unknown, as all indications point towards a collapse that will, in the words of economist Peter Schiff, be the earthquake that follows the 2008 tremor. The Chicago Tribune reported that about 3,000 individuals with net assets of $1 million or more left Chicago in the last year alone due to the exploding climate of unrest growing in the union stockyards. The writing is on the wall. President Obama, in concert with his puppet master George Soros, have been turning up the heat on deteriorating conditions resulting from the United States and the EU's strategic collapse of the global economy for the last Last seven years. So if somebody wants to build a coal power plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that uh, greenhouse gas that's being emitted. Before Obama ever came around, coal was doing good. Obama killed it. We have citizens digging through the trash just to eat. I wish he'd just step off the face of the earth. It wouldn't hurt my feelings none. What's actually hurt coal is not any EPA rules as much as it is really cheap natural gas that has come from fracking. They're fracking with, with such corrupt practices across the United States that the, the well water is, is, is catching on fire. Whoa. Soros signals Argentina shale his biggest place to be. Soros doubled his stake in state-owned oil company in Argentina while for the last seven years spending tens of millions of dollars to lobby to shut down shale production in the U.S. by wildcat small companies. And I'm not saying shale fracking is good overall. I'm not saying there aren't problems, but most of it's financed by Soros and Saudi Arabia who don't want us to have our own oil. So a coal plant in Mexico that's totally dirty is okay, but a coal plant in Texas that's clean is not okay. And most of these uh, frackers and, and oil sand people can't uh, can't break even uh, unless oil's over eighty dollars or at least over fifty five. That's I think right. It's going to be Ten to twenty in the next next several years. So this is their what they're doing is they're pumping their existing wells to the max to create cash flow because their wells are, are is not. It's not expensive to pump. It's expensive to find the darn things and drill. 
And they were only able to do that with the cheapest junk bonds in history because of quantitative easing and an artificial stimulus and high oil prices. So, so that's the next thing to hit the United States. The Wall Street Journal reports that the largest coal company in the United States has filed for bankruptcy, an event that will result in energy costs that will sharply rise on the American middle class like they have on the common people of Germany. Germany's energy policies have gradually doubled the average industrial cost per kilowatt hour as clean and renewable energy can't carry the load, literally. Last week, Obama began pushing for housing lenders to offer home loans to people with bad credit. What better way to push the economy over the edge than to repeat the same 2008 nightmare? We're using data on housing and neighborhood conditions to help cities identify the areas that need the most help. By 2014, investors had already begun to notice another government-fed subprime housing bubble on the horizon. Investors Business Daily wrote in January of 2014, what stoked housing inflation was federal housing policies designed to boost home ownership among low-income and minority borrowers. Between 2011 and the third quarter of 2013, housing prices rose nearly 6% triple the increase in rental costs. Both this bubble and the last one were caused by the government's housing policies. Low down payments, a mere 5% at Fannie and Freddie, and just 3.5% at the FHA are fueling the bubble. But new qualified mortgage rules don't require a minimum down payment for borrowers in 2014. The country has been misled about financial reform. InfoWars has called for Obama's impeachment on numerous occasions, to no avail. His supposed lame duck presidency heading into the end of his term has been tremendously underestimated. Americans are nothing less than under a full New World Order attack, aided and abetted by the executive branch of the United States of America. John Bound for InfoWars.com the Florida state attorney has decided not to prosecute Trump's campaign manager for the alleged assault of former Breitbart reporter Michelle Fields, according to new video that reportedly debunks her claims. The press was directed toward the back. There's this bubble and she makes her way beyond the press area and gets right next to Mr. Trump and actually makes slight contact with Mr. Trump. And you can see that he sort of recoils and that's when Mr. Lewandowski comes in grabs her arm. Now, according to that prosecutor, Michelle Fields was disappointed with their decision, and now she says she's going to go after Trump and his campaign manager in a civil case for defamation of character. Now, a civil case, of course, you don't have to present as much evidence, could be a little easier for her to win here, but let's revisit a report from Paul Joseph Watson where he breaks down why Michelle Fields might have already defamed herself. The truth about the supposed battery of Breitbart journalist Michelle Fields by Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski is that Fields, Lewandowski and supporters of both are all lying about what happened. Today it was confirmed that Lewandowski had been charged with misdemeanor battery for an incident earlier this month when Lewandowski appeared to grab Fields' arm to prevent her from asking Trump a question. A new surveillance video released by police shows Lewandowski yanking Fields back by the arm. First of all, why are Fields supporters pretending like this is the first time we've seen video of this incident? This video of the incident was released weeks ago, yet was largely glossed over by the media because it contradicted Fields' characterization of what happened. Michelle Fields lied about the incident from the start. She claimed, quote, somebody had grabbed me tightly by the arm and yanked me down. The video footage clearly shows that she was pulled back, not yanked down. Fields said, quote, I almost fell to the ground but was able to maintain my balance. The video footage clearly shows she did not almost fall to the ground. She also claims that Lewandowski, quote, aggressively tried to pull me to the ground. The video clearly shows that's not what happened. She also went on television claiming that this was the worst thing to happen to her in her entire life, apart from her father dying. 
Well, it feels awful. Um, this has to be, aside from my father's death, the worst experience I've gone through. Unless Fields has lived a near-perfect utopian life, that's obviously a massive exaggeration. Despite the fact that Fields was obviously completely mischaracterizing the incident, the media bolstered her credibility because it synced with their narrative of demonizing Trump, his staffers, and his supporters as unhinged, violent extremists. Fields told police that she fell back, but caught herself from falling. The video clearly shows she did not fall back. But Corey Lewandowski also lied about the incident from the start. He told Fields, quote, You are totally delusional. I never touched you. But the video clearly shows that, yes, Lewandowski grabbed her arm. Trump supporters are also still claiming that Lewandowski never touched her or that he just brushed past her. The video proves that this isn't true. Lewandowski was also caught on camera in a previous incident manhandling a protester. In another twist to the story, a Secret Service agent told the Daily Mail that Michelle Fields grabbed Trump twice and was warned to back off before the incident involving Lewandowski. Look, it's true that Lewandowski grabbed Fields by the arm to get her out of the way. Was it rude, aggressive, and unnecessary? Yes. Was it some kind of egregious assault as it's being characterized by some? No. Lewandowski will probably not be convicted. But the media will continue to obsess about this for at least another month. Meanwhile, Donald Trump himself will continue to be deluged with death threats, more unhinged leftists will try and rush the stage, and more Bernie Sanders supporters will attack Trump voters and stage violence at his rallies. And the media will continue to blame all of this on Donald Trump. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host. We're going to be interviewing Art Thompson. He is the uh, head of the John Birch Society. Of course, you can find them at jbs.org, thenewamerican.com. Before we go live to uh, Mr. Thompson, I want to play a clip for you, something, a presentation that he, he does. Uh, Heidi Cruz, first lady of the North American Union. We're going to break that down, talking to him live. But, you know, when we have an election... One of the things that we want to do is we want to first obviously ask, what are these people proposing to do? And then we want to say, well, can we trust them in this? Are they authentic? You know, we look at somebody like Bernie Sanders. You know, I think Bernie is really authentic, but I don't like what he's proposing to do. I don't like socialism, but he's authentic. But then on the other hand, we got somebody like Ted Cruz, and he says some good things about supporting the Constitution. He wants to appoint judges who are originalists, who take the Constitution uh, not as a living document, but who take it as written, who take it as with its original intent. People like Justice Scalia was. He says many things like that. He says he supports the Second Amendment, so forth and so on. But then we see that he's changed his position in some very uncomfortable ways when it comes to things like these trade partnerships and then voting first to shut down the constitutional process to ratify these trade treaties, the transatlantic, the trans-Pacific partnership, to shut down the constitutional process, which says 67% of the senators will approve this. No, no, they changed it to a simple majority. They shut down any amendments. They shut down any debating. They shut down any filibustering of this. They said, once we give this secretly negotiated agreement to you, then it's going to be run through in a certain period of time. If you don't bring it to the floor, it's going to go there automatically. You're not going to be able to talk about it or amend it. It's just going to be there. Okay. Now he voted for that process. It didn't quite make it the first time. He got a second chance at it and then he's getting closer to the presidential election. So then he votes against it. Okay. So who are these people? I want to play this clip from uh, Arthur Thompson about uh, Heidi Cruz, and then we'll talk to him uh, directly. Let's run that clip. And yet these were the recommendations out of this committee of the Council on Foreign Relations, which lists Heidi Cruz as one of those task force members. And in, it says here, it's got an asterisk back, uh, by her name, and the asterisk says this, the individual has endorsed the report 
and submitted an additional or descending view. So you go back to the descending view of, of Heidi Cruz, and this is what she says. I support the task force report and its recommendations aimed at building a safer and more prosperous North America. And then she goes on and says that, that she is just concerned that we maintain the ability of these banks to be able to run the, the banking regulations and that sort of thing instead of making it a state thing. Well, that's no surprise because at the same time, Heidi Cruz had Morgan uh, connections and then subsequently went on and became part of the Goldman Sachs banking uh, empire. And incidentally, her husband got a very sweetheart deal from Goldman Sachs for his campaign that he just forgot to mention to uh, anybody in his public disclosure. Yeah, and that's a very interesting way that he got around that. Essentially, he declared it, but he didn't put it in the place where anybody would look for it. See, that's, that's the cleverness of Ted Cruz. And joining us right now is Arthur Thompson. Art has held virtually every volunteer and staff position in the John Birch Society, including National Director of Development and Communications and National Director of Field Activities. For several years, he represented the John Birch Society in a variety of media events, including appearing on 60 Minutes and was for a short time on the Speakers Bureau of the John Birch Society. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Thompson. Uh, when I look at that particular declaration of Ted Cruz, to me, that is the kind of lawyerly tricks that <laughs> I seem to come to expect from, from Ted Cruz. The fact that he would file it in the wrong place and put it there and wait until somebody had discovered it and then say, oh, no, we actually did file it. We just didn't tell the Federal Elections Commission about this loan because it was very important for him at the time to distance himself from Goldman Sachs. People had pointed out some of these connections uh, to uh, that his wife had with Goldman Sachs, the Council on Foreign Relations, and, and he called them a pit of vipers. But then uh, he was taking uh, a large donation from that pit of vipers when he was running for, for Senate. Well, that's true. Uh, before we get into it too much, though, uh, I'd like to point out that we tell people about all the candidates. Yes. Uh, we don't take positions as to who to vote for and, and that sort of thing. We stay out of partisan politics, but we will have things like uh, articles on, on Trump that are also revealing, uh, just asking questions, bringing out facts. We want people to understand what's going on before they go into the voting booth. Absolutely. Uh, and so we get hit from all sides <laughs> when yeah. we, we bring these things out, whether it's Trump people or Cruz people or whomever it may be. And that's a key thing, too. I think people need to understand, you know, when I looked at Donald Trump I, at the very beginning, I was uh, very much opposed to Donald Trump because what I saw happening was a cult of personality like I had seen with Barack Obama. He at that point had not really talked about any issues. And I really wasn't aware personally of how hard he had hit the uh, trade issues going back into the 1990s, the mid 1980s, how he was running ads in uh, the New York Times complaining about how we were being ripped off in trade and so forth and, and talking about an America first foreign policy. So I didn't see that and I hadn't seen him talk about any policies. I just saw a cult of personality. And I thought, boy, this is really dangerous. But, you know, we have a per cult of personality that develops around every single candidate. You know, right. there, there's a cult of personality around Donald Trump. There's one around Ted Cruz. And we need to recognize that we need to not become a part of that. And we need to pull back and say, where do they stand on the issues? And now that we're into the campaign this long, we can understand where they are on the issues. But then there's also the issue of who these people are. Are they authentic? Who's been their influence? And, you know, wh what is going on behind the scenes? And I think that's where it is very important to take a look at the connections of Heidi Cruz to Goldman Sachs, particularly to Wall Street in general. Because when she was on that commission with Robert Zellick, uh, she was working for a different bank. And so when she says, well, I, I did a dissenting opinion on the findings of the Council on Foreign Relations about a North American union, uh, she wasn't dissenting too much because the guy who was running it, Robert Zellick, hired her to come join him at Goldman Sachs after that. Well, uh, with working with Robert Pastor, she helped write this plan for a North American Union. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She was a five-year member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And let's put that into a little bit of perspective, if we can. 
First of all, the Council on Foreign Relations stands for a one world government under a managed economy, a socialism in a word. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to be vetted before you become a member of the, of the Council on Foreign Relations. I believe you have, a, have to have at least two other members uh, sponsor you. And then you go before a membership committee and they take a look at whether or not they're going to allow you to be a member. And so you have to go through that process. Apparently they liked what they saw and, uh, and uh, okayed her membership. So when we get closer to the campaign, however, uh, she drops that membership. You have to ask the question, why? And the other thing is, too, that during all this process, uh, Cruz was for these, these uh, treaties, the yes. TPP and the TTIP, et cetera. And he wrote an op-ed piece with Paul Ryan in support of these, these treaties as well. That's right. Now, the thing is that he says, for instance, on one of his, on one of the Republican debates, he said, I never have supported the TPP. Well, mm. technically that may be true, but he supported the process of negotiating the TPP. And we have letters from his constituents showing that support. So he may claim now that it has been a done deal, it's been negotiated through that he disagrees with it, but he didn't disagree with it uh, two years ago or three years ago. That's right. He was writing op-ed pieces of Paul Ryan saying in theory, you know, calling it free trade. And look, I, I would agree with free trade if we had free trade, if we had a free market. But when you have thousands of pages of an agreement that are written by foreign, uh, by multinational corporate lawyers and lobbyists, and our elected representatives are not allowed to see it until uh, a very late in the process. And then when you had Senator Sessions take a look at it, he said, this is a living agreement. It isn't, even if you understand what these 5,000 pages of, of uh, managed trade are going to be, at that point, you're going to be creating a multinational commission that is going to have the authority to change the terms of this agreement. In other words, a multinational commission that you have no control over, that you don't appoint anybody, you can't remove anyone from. Rob Dew with Infowars.com. You're looking at Grand Central Station and next door is the Grand Hyatt Hotel. Up there is the Chrysler Building if you're looking for your New York landmarks. And here's a giant speaker that it looks like some protesters have just erected inside this barrier here to protest Donald Trump coming to New York City, along with Ted Cruz and John Kasich, although there's not much outcry for him. There's definitely a lot of anti-Trump signs and Black Lives Matter signs here. We were just on the Alex Jones show with Anthony Gucciardi showing people the process, but here's a bunch of signs. I got cardboard tubes on them. Uh, the yellow, black, those are Black Lives Matter signs. There's some in Spanish, some in English. Uh, this is about, looks like a young man who was killed. His name was Akai. And uh, so the, the preparations are ongoing right now. As you can see, most there's not a lot of protesters here now. It's mostly people coming home or going to work. But they have set up these barricades. There's a lot of police on hand, a lot more police looks like coming. There you can see some more signs. The preparations are going fast and furious at this point. As you can see, uh, protesters have now shut down East 42nd Street, not allowing cars to come by, and now they are about to march, it looks like, into the road. Police are having to redirect traffic at this point in time. This is definitely an interesting day thus far. We're here! We're here! We're fabulous! Don't fuck with us! We're here! We're clear! We're fabulous! Don't fuck with us! We're here! We're clear! We're fabulous! Don't fuck with us! We're here! As you can see, they're trying to move their uh, wall of people further into the road and a major intersection at East 42nd Street and Lexington Avenue in downtown New York City. This is crazy. And here is the uh, the hotel where the uh, GOP uh, gala is being conducted right now with Donald Trump, John Kasich, and Ted Cruz. Trump and Cruz have got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Trump and Cruz have got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Trump and Cruz have got to go. Hey, hey. Ho, ho. Trump and Cruz have got to go. Hey, hey
yourself. Learn how to shoot an AR-15. Learn how to protect yourself. Get the fuck away. Learn how to shoot an AR-15. Learn how to shoot an AR-15. That's all you guys got. 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 That's all uh, Bernie supporters, all I can say is fascism and uh, socialism doesn't work. Uh, we need to be working. We need to earn our own money. We don't need anybody uh, supporting us. We need to be working and keep busy and, and make a great income and raise our families. And uh, we've already, we already know that uh, socialism doesn't work. We already tested that. Yeah, and just to be clear, you you went into this area to promote your business. You didn't go in there to like start a fight with anybody. No, I went there to promote my business and to give out flyers and tell people to learn how to protect themselves and learn how to shoot an AR-15 because I didn't know how to shoot an AR-15 until two years ago. And uh, once I learned how to shoot an AR-15 and the Glock, I was very happy. And and uh, I think every every citizen who is uh, not a criminal should have a firearm access. Joe Biden says you should get a shotgun. Oh, a shotgun? That's uh, not good for everything. For certain things, but not everything. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck to you. Thanks for promoting the Second Amendment. Thank you. All right. Well, that's it for the show tonight. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you here tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central.